I'll invite you to rise now for a time of singing praises to the Lord. Our first song will be found in the Faith We Sing booklets in the pews and also on the screens, 2161. next song is Where the Spirit of the Lord Is, <coughs> song number 2119 in the faith we sing. song is number 2152, Change My Heart, O God. Friends, please join me in our call to worship as printed in the bulletin and on the screens. 
Let us pray. God of our mothers and fathers, God of ages past, God of all tomorrows, we have come here in answer to your invitation. We come as companions on a journey and are a mixed multitude of attitudes and stations in life. Some of us are on top of the world and others of us have been wearied by the ordinariness of our days. Yet we are all in search of something new. Surprise us, Lord, with a glimpse of your presence as you did for your prophets of old. And we'll continue with our opening hymn this morning, number 294, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed, 294. Please be seated. Friends, we have the opportunity now in our service to share how God has blessed us and also the opportunity to lift up to the Lord our concerns and the needs of those who are near and dear to us. Are there prayer cards or prayer requests or celebrations to be shared this day? I can share with you that at the first service, there were prayers asked for Jean Miller, who is in the hospital for tests. We have uh, requests for prayer for two friends of Amy Burkhart, Marion and Harriet, who are both facing surgery. And we have a prayer for Marilyn, who is having difficulty walking and is seeking relief. Are there other needs, other celebrations to bring up? Do we have any birthdays? Travel. travel mercies. Travel mercies for all of our friends who are at the beach and travel mercies for those who are taking flights to the other side of the world soon. Australia, right? Okay, and you'll let us know if people are upside down. Okay, yeah, just 
All right, yeah. Research process. Okay, good to know. Thanks, John. Anyone else? Yes. Tom, severe stroke, thank you. Anyone else? Well, we can continue our prayers for our brother Dick, who's with us today. Um, he has health concerns that have not yet been resolved, and we're praying that uh, that'll soon come to resolution. Let's uh, place ourselves before God and lift up these petitions. Gracious God, we ask you to be with our sister, Jeannie Miller, who, in addition to her grief at the passing of her long-term spouse, John, is also battling health concerns. We pray that uh, you will heal her and bring her back to her home so that she can rest and heal in comfort. We pray for Marion and Harriet, both of whom are facing surgery this week. We pray that you will give the surgeons discerning eyes and skilled hands and we pray that you will heal Marion and Harriet post-surgery as rapidly as possible and grant them full and vital health. We pray that you will give the medical professionals who are examining Marilyn wisdom and the ability to discern what is wrong and to bring her relief and the ability to move more freely and more comfortably. We pray for Tom and his healing following the stroke that he had, and Lord, we ask you to bring him full and vital and vibrant health. Lord, we know too that there are many other concerns, many other needs. We pray traveling mercies for those who are on the roads, either beginning vacations or returning home. We ask protection for all who are on the roads and in the air. And Lord, we pray a special blessing on those who are traveling far. We ask you to be with the clingers and their friends in Australia and grant them a restful and fun-filled vacation experience. Lord, there are undoubtedly other needs, other situations, other people that need our prayers. And so we take this moment to share silently in our own thoughts and hearts the needs and the situations of those near and dear to us. Gracious Lord, hear our silent prayers. Lord, we pray for all of the petitions that have been lifted this day, whether by our lips, in the silence of our hearts, and on the printed page in our bulletin. We pray for our military personnel, especially those who are in harm's way. We pray for our community, especially our first responders and those whom they serve. Lord, we pray for our nation, we pray that um, people will come together and work together and move our nation forward in ways that will honor you and prove to be a blessing to your people. And now, Lord, we look to you and we offer the prayer that Jesus himself gave us, saying in unity, in confidence, and in faith, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is there a desire for a hymn choice from the congregation this morning. Is there anyone who will choose a hymn for us?
408. Gift of life, 408. Gift of love? Gift of love, 408. Thank you, friends. Please be seated. This time I will ask the ushers to come forward and receive God's tithes and our offerings. Gracious God, we ask you to bless the gifts and bless the givers. We return to you a small portion of all that you have granted to us. You have poured your blessings upon us, more than we can receive, more than we can use. We return to you a small portion of this and ask that you bless and multiply it. Use it to advance the work of your kingdom and Lord, use it to bless others that your glory may be experienced and talked about. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The reading this morning is one, uh, one of 
of my favorite letters from Paul. It's from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. So then, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the spirit of himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope, because a creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until to now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So ends the reading of the word. When Paul writes his letters, what we call the epistles, he is writing as a pastor or as a missionary to churches, to bodies of believers. And sometimes the thing that we forget as contemporary folk who hear little sections of the readings is that what they actually were sent are the full epistles, the full letter. And so what Paul wrote was actually designed to be heard all in one reading, which I imagine would be a massive undertaking. A lot of reading and a lot of uh, comparing and contrasting. Paul was trained in rhetoric and he was trained as somebody who constructed arguments that compared and contrasted certain things and balanced them and also he constructed arguments that built on themselves step by step by step to a logical conclusion. The scriptures that we hear this morning are the fruition, the conclusion, the climax of an argument that Paul has been making all along about the tension that we live in as people of faith in a fallen world. Our Sunday school lesson for this morning uh, after the early service was in the Old Testament. It was about another, another prophetic utterance from the prophet Ezekiel. And the prophet Ezekiel was given a scroll to eat and he ate the scroll. This is a vision obviously. He wasn't physically given a scroll to eat. But God, in a vision, gave him a scroll to eat, and he ate it, and it tasted like honey. And the scroll contained woes and oracles of judgment. Now, how can a scroll that contained woes and oracles of judgment be sweet? It tasted sweet because even though 
God was announcing judgment upon the people, it was permeated with grace and with love and was given to the people in order that they would be blessed if they were obedient to it. The same thing with Paul. Paul's letter to the Roman church is, I think, him battling in his own mind about how to come to some reconciliation regarding the promise and the possibilities and the grace that God expresses to the world through Jesus Christ and the challenges that exist to those of us who are human beings in a fallen world. Paul writes a whole lot in the book of Romans about the tension between the flesh and the spirit. He talks about the flesh as a negative. The flesh is the world. The world where people are drawn to sin, drawn to making the wrong choice, drawn to wealth, drawn to anything that distracts them from paying attention to God. There is a tension between the spirit and the flesh. And Paul writes very clearly that the world, indeed all of creation, is groaning in travail. That doesn't sound very pleasant, but it is positive in the sense that God is working to bring something better into being. God's plan for creation was that everything was good, everything was beautiful, everything was in full completion as he designed it. And through the church, through the people of God, God is working to bring the, the entire cosmos, all of creation, back into alignment with his design for it. I'm calling my meditation for this morning a part of the family. It's funny how God works in our lives. At the first service, Becky Deptula told us she had a God moment earlier in the week. She was working at the farm stand, and her old Sunday school teacher from when she was a little girl came up and ordered several bags worth of uh, vegetables and fruits and goods. And there were other people behind her in line. And so Becky said to the people behind the lady in line, would you please wait for me so I can help this woman take her bags to her car? You know, she's gonna need some help. And the people behind the lady said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll carry the stuff out to her car. So they carried the stuff out to her car for her. And Becky called that a God moment. <clears throat> God is around us all the time. God is with us all the time. Sometimes we need to just have, as scripture says, eyes that see and ears that hear. I had a couple of God moments this morning, or this, this week, <coughs> excuse me, that I think illustrate very well what Paul is trying to say in the scriptures. Paul talks about believers being people who are members of the family of God. They are heirs to the family of God. They are sons through adoption. They are part of the family of God. And so in my meditations for the preparation for this meditation, I was thinking about family and belonging and adoption. And I can tell you from experience that sometimes you earn your spot in the group and sometimes you are made a part of the group through grace and through people embracing you whether you deserve to be there or not. When I was in high school, I guess it's still popular, um, they gave sports out for people who performed well in athletics. You know, there's people that you get a letter if you earn points or win events or whatever. Uh, 
In my high school, there were people that were letters in one, two, three, or four sports. I lettered in track one year, but I was never made a member of the letterman's club because you had to have two or more letters to be in the letterman's club. And then, of course, the letterman's jacket was a big deal. But you earned it. You deserved it through performance. You demonstrated competency and capacity to be a member of that group. Well, you may know, and if you don't know, I'll tell you, that since I came up here to the Irish Valley, I have been attempting to learn to be a volunteer firefighter. And I was at fire school this past week, and I learned very um, viscerally that I'm, I'm not a truck person. I'm not, a, I'm not a roof person. I was in Shimokin, and they had what they called a roof simulator. They had a slanted roof about eight feet square, several feet in the air, and we had to work on it and cut holes in it with chainsaws. Doesn't sound very hard, but when you're wearing 80 pounds of gear and you're inflexible like I am because of a back injury, it's not the, the, the easiest thing in the world to do. Plus, I was being instructed by people that are really good on ladders. We had a roof ladder up against this simulator and people were walking up and down it like a staircase, carrying equipment. I can't do that. I was <laughs> and, and I get up on the roof, and I don't bend real well, so I'm trying to cut a hole in the roof with a chainsaw, and I'm wearing 80 pounds of gear, and it's hot, and I'm sweating, and I can't get this. Why do they put the pull on the left side of a chainsaw? That doesn't make any sense to me. I couldn't get the chainsaw going. I had a horrible time. So I finally got the thing going and I, cut, I made two cuts in the thing. My eyes were sweaty, I, I dripping on my glasses, I couldn't see, I was hot and I couldn't bend. And finally I said, you know what? I don't need to be doing this. There's no way on God's earth they're ever gonna ask me to go up on a roof and cut a hole in a roof. I said, I, I'm, just, I'm just done. So I put this all down and my instructor said, are, are you okay, do you wanna rest? I said, no, I wanna get down. So I just got down. but. I failed that evolution. There, there's like a hundred skills you're supposed to have as, as a firefighter if you want the credentialing. So I failed my first one. So if I get a 99, I guess I'll be okay. But I did not earn my spot on the squad that day. I just didn't have the capacity to do what was necessary. So, you know, I'm not going to be the guy on the roof cutting holes in it. But on Saturday, the fire department was called to a funeral in Shimokin for a, um, a deceased firefighter who was a previous fireman and, and an officer. And we went in, in uniform, all of us together. There were several different departments there. And I walked into the room in uniform, with a badge, had a little band on it, and I was immediately accepted. Nobody asked me what I had done to deserve to be there. Nobody asked me, did you pass your skill station? Nobody said, are you actually qualified to be here as a member of this body of people? The firefighters are a very close-knit brotherhood and sisterhood of people who serve their community. The people who serve as firefighters give to the community. The alarm goes off, they stop what they're doing, they go out, they show up, and they assist people that are in need of help. And they embrace everybody who serves. There's no question about whether you're qualified, competent, or deserve to be there. If you have the uniform, if you ride the trucks, if you show up to help, you're part of the group. It's a grace thing. And I think that's what Paul is talking about in the scriptures in Romans. God opened up the family of God, not because people deserve to be a part of it, but because his grace, his love is wide enough to make room for everybody. If you go through the book of Romans, 
Paul makes a point of saying that God first reached out to Abram, who became Abraham, and made a promise to Abraham. He promised him land, he promised him descendants, and he promised him that through that connection, there would eventually be a blessing to all people around the world. So God began with one family, and then that family expanded to be one people, one nation, and then through that nation of people, blessings percolated out throughout the world, eventually those blessings will come to all people everywhere. And not only that, eventually all of the universe, all of the creation will be blessed through the activities of people who believe in God. And I said earlier that the gospel is not the gospel unless there is grace and good news in it. Hearing the scriptures say that the world groans in travail and that people pray in words that don't even have expression, they don't even have the words for what they're praying for, we're talking about living in the tension between the world that was the world that Paul calls the world of the flesh, the world of sin, the world of death, the world of limited mortality, and the future where God has everything restored into full alignment with his vision and his desires and his creation. The Christian church is called to live on that overlap between the world that was and the world that will be. And so we live in tension. We live in tension between the world of the flesh and the world of the spirit, the world that was and the world that will be. Some of my older colleagues complain to me about young people becoming passionate about different things that don't seem to be connected to spirituality. My daughter is an ecologist. She always is fussing about the environment. She yells at me if I throw something away that should be recycled. I, gotta, I, I hate to disappoint her, but Ralpho Township has limited recycling. We, I take what we can take, but other things we throw away. But my daughter is very concerned about the environment. Um, some of my colleagues get upset when people talk about global warming or plastic in the oceans or social justice issues like why is there so many people in prison in the United States versus other developing nations? Um, social justice issues such as uh, different forms of discrimination among different marginalized groups. My colleagues, the older people, would say, why are they worried about that? That's got nothing to do with the church. That's got nothing to do with spirit. Well, not in the minimalistic sense, but in the sense of God's overall design and God's overall intention, we who are the church, we who are the body of Christ, are called to assist God in advancing the work of his kingdom and eventually restoring creation, society, and all people into alignment with his vision. God's desire is that all people will know him. God's desire and plan is that all people will love each other be served by each other and offer service to each other. God's plan for the creation is that eventually all things will come back into alignment with his original design, his original plans, the original beauty and goodness and integrity of design that he planned. And so on the one hand, I can see how Worrying about things that are of the earth can be dismissed as non-spiritual because after all, it's things of the flesh. 
But God's desire is that eventually the entire world will be restored to his design. Paul talks about people, I'm trying to think of what it was. I hate, this is the bad thing about not having notes. <laughs> talked about the grace I talked about it's gone <laughs> I apologize I'll just have to close here this is unusual for me I wanted to say one more thing that was good it's gone I should write a note I'm sorry apologize it happens so I will close my deliberations here with an admonishment to all of us to remember that even when God disciplines us, even when God gives us a should and ought to, a have to, the reason behind it is for our ultimate blessing and our ultimate good. I, I sometimes have difficulty with the, uh, the book of Romans. It seems to me kind of negative about travail and challenge and anxiety and stress. But in the end, there is room in the family of God for everyone who God embraces, and that is everyone. Think about this. When God first approached Abram, there was only Abram and Sarah. He promised them descendants. Eventually, those descendants became a body of people that became a nation. And that nation of people took the good news of God and sent it out. Eventually, God, God shaped, saved those people from slavery. Think about how God took the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. He led them to freedom through the desert. Fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. He parted the Red Sea to make a path for them to safety. He parted the River Jordan so that they could receive the promised land. And eventually, God extended that blessing to all people, not just the Jewish people, but to all people. And God extended the promise beyond the promised land to all lands and nations, and then eventually to all of creation. So we who are believers have both an opportunity and a blessing. We've been blessed that God opened his family up to us, and we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Think about that. We are brothers and sisters to Jesus, and we receive the blessings that he receives in heaven. Not only that, we have the opportunity to do our own share in advancing the work of the kingdom. Yes, we're living in tension between what was and what will one day be. But in that tension, in that challenge, we have the ability and the potential to make maximum impact for the kingdom to the further honor and glory of God. I pray that some of what I said to you this morning will give you food for thought and encouragement in your faith journey. Amen. Friends, I'll invite you to rise as you are able in body or spirit and join in our closing hymn this day, number 57. Oh, four a thousand tongues to sing. We'll sing three verses.
join together now in our closing chorus, O Lamb of God. <laughs> Friends, let's join together and pray the dismissal with blessing. God promised that every family of the earth would receive a blessing through God's people. You are blessed to be a blessing. You have been blessed. Now go and be a blessing. Amen. Friends, our service is ended. Let us depart in peace until we gather again in worship of God.